working on this for a decade, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I started writing it in 2012, uh, which was ended up being my senior year of college. And Apocalypse was on the mind of many people because the Mayan calendar had predicted it that year. Uh, Clearly, that did not come to pass. But that was like a hot topic of conversation. And I was really struggling with my own depression while also seeing this big chapter of my life come to an end, Um, you know, my college time ending as well. So I definitely had endings on my brain. um, And I started a senior writing class with Jenny Boylan, who's this fantastic writer. And in retrospect, I mean, I I thought it was cool at the time, but now I'm like, I got to do that. You know, it's it's even cooler in retrospect, but she was an incredible professor and really helped me shape the book and figure out what that shape of it could look like. Obviously, it took me a decade past that time to finish it, but that's when I first started imagining the characters and scenes and putting it on paper. And in that time, obviously, your life has changed a lot. So when you began the process, it was a lot of endings, but now in your life, you have a lot of beginnings. Mm -hmm. So how does that change your perspective on, on the work on the book? Yeah. So it's been interesting, um, over the course of writing this book, so much has happened in my life. And more recently I uh, adopted a, a child last October. And so, becoming a parent for the first time is one of the biggest shifts in identity that I've ever had in really beautiful ways and also of course challenging ones. Uh, but it was interesting. I was really in the final stages of editing this book, but had to reread it of course, a number of times to work on it. And it was like the first time I was identifying with the parent characters. There's the main character, Avery's parents, but then also her brother who has a young child and they're all really major characters in the story. And before I had to imagine what it would feel like for them. And then all of a sudden I had this new appreciation for those characters that of course I created, but I don't remember exactly like what I added at that time, but I think there was a little bit of emotional richness that I suddenly had that I hadn't had before. So, and you know, when I first started writing this book, I was, I thought it was straight, which is hilarious. And, um, you know, 10 years later, I've obviously come to learn so much more about who I am as a person and that shaped the book a ton as well um so it's been I really grew up with this book and when you talk about coming of age like came of age with this book and I think we're all kind of coming of age all the time but for me so much of my self-discovery is wrapped up in the pages and when I'm tempted to criticize the book or feel insecure about different things I just remind myself like how much of me I put into it and not just me now, but different versions of me and people that I love. Yeah. It, I mean, it, obviously I, I read the book previously and then, you know, reread it recently. And um, yeah, I, I find myself identifying with the older characters more so, but yeah, there's, there's so many layers to it. You're so like for a first book, like the, the layers and just um, how you get into the psyche of the characters. I feel like we don't get that very often from first, you know, first published um, books. And I know you're working on a, a new book now Mm -hmm. uh, Do you, do you feel that your approach has changed in, in that time? Like, let me rephrase that. So it, it took a a decade to get this in people's hands. It's probably not going to be another 10 years before we hope (laughs) the next one. Um, So there's probably good and bad things about it taking that long, but was part of your personal growth and the process part of why you were able to, like, I don't know what the early drafts, like, was it always like, so? Well, 
So I originally didn't write it as YA, not anything against YA, just like I didn't read a lot of YA up until I was an adult and didn't really understand it as I know it's an age group, but it kind of to me, there's a lot of, you know, hot takes on this. But like to me, it kind of is a genre as well in the sense that it has its own like conventions and tropes and, you know, expectations when you open the pages of what you're going to find and the type of content that's in it, um, which is, of course, all relevant to the age group. But I was mostly reading adult books at the time. I had originally said it where she was like a senior in college, uh, same, and was kind of like at the precipice of graduating in her new life and didn't really know what to do with it. Um, but and I, to be honest, had a lot of like resentment for a long time that people were kind of pushing it into YA when I went to query agents, you know, like a lot of them said, I think this is a YA book. And uh, when I was like applying to different fellowships and things like that, I would always get into the YA programs, but not the adult ones. Um, and again, like YA is like, most of what I read now, I love it. I think it's really beautiful. And I love coming of age themes and finding yourself. Um, and I think there's some really beautiful queer work that's being done in that space. And it's some of my favorite books, but I just did it. That was not my intention with the book. And I didn't totally understand why people saw it that way. Like, I didn't know if it was because it was um, a women's voice or, you know, like I just, I wasn't sure, but um Anyway, like eventually I did come to a lot of agents gave me the feedback. It would work better if she was a freshman and that, you know, it used to be like way, way, way darker too. Like it was like a lot of, there was um, people who died, you know, in the story and like that doesn't happen anymore. So I really like had to let go of a lot of my original ideas for the story once I decided to publish it. Um, and strangely enough, like, COVID actually completely shifted my uh, thoughts around it again, because like originally it was pretty dark. I really wanted people who had never like experienced these types of big doom feelings to really feel that while you're reading the book and feel like the pain that this character's feeling. And then we're, then I had made it YA. So I let go of a lot of it and I again, kind of resented it. And then COVID happened and it totally changed my perspective. Cause I'm like, nobody needs to imagine that anymore. Everybody has just gone through this extremely traumatic event, you know, that obviously we're still going through, but those, the first two years or so were so life altering and devastating and confusing. And so suddenly I'm like, if I'm going to put this book into the world right now, I don't, I think it needs more levity. I think it needs more hope. I think it needs, so whether or not it was young adult or adult, I think I would have had that same shift at that time of like, this book has to be the book that should enter the world today, not five years ago, 10 years ago when I was writing it at those times. So it was a weird experience in that way. But, and now like moving on to my new book, yeah, it's it's weird to imagine because right now I'm sort of in that first stage of like, here's my original idea around it. And of course, now I have an editor who's like amazing. And so she'll help me a lot. And I'm sure other people will read it and help me too. But I'm, it's scary because I'm like, <laughs> I know how much it took to get that first book to the place that it is now. And imagining all that work in a much shorter period of time is terrifying. But I have to kind of trust that I've learned a couple things and that you know, I have way more help this time. Um, and so like those, those are the two things that I'm sort of crossing my fingers and hoping it's enough, but it is scary because it does to get those types of layers. It takes many, many drafts of like, okay, this draft, I'm going to go through and just focus on this character and what they're feeling in different scenes and totally re rework the book around them. So, you know, it's really just putting the time in, but it's scary and exciting. <laughs> Well, it's it's kind of like you have uh, the end of the world coming. Like you have that that definite deadline over your head. It's like, yeah, what what will you do if you only have nine days? Like, I thought about that. Like, what would I do? Like, I don't know. Like, I feel like that also uh, when you're in that situation where like you have a deadline. Like for me, like because I'm so neurodivergent. Like then I like that's motivating to me. Like. Mm -hmm. like I'll like okay I'm gonna write the thing but like having all that time and like you don't know if it's gonna get published and then you were talking about the the pandemic and the shutdown we didn't know how long that was gonna go initially they said you know a couple of months then it's you yeah. know years and it's like that like for me was like it 
people, you know, picked up hobbies and used that time. Well, I didn't because I needed to, I needed to know when, mm -hmm. like, this is a forced vacation, but like, when do we go back to the thing? I need to know what the goalposts are. So mm -hmm. I just kind of pulled into myself. So, um, yeah, I like blocked out a lot. I'm like, what did I do? I don't <laughs> I mean, I was working on the book and working and all that, but still, it was, it's kind of all a blur at this point. I'm like, there were some weird chapters, but yeah, it's working on a deadline is, I don't know, this is kind of my first time doing it. So uh, is it going well? Is it not? Like, who's to say? <laughs> um, but I'm trying to build more structure around it now and I'm kind of just working through it. Do you, do you have to set like writing time for yourself or do you... Like, do you sit down and you're like, I'm going to write? Or, or are you just like, I feel like writing, I'm going to go do that. Like, what's your process? I'm still figuring it out too. Like, I think what I've learned about myself, which is really frustrating, is that I need like hours to get into the mindset, reorient myself and like what I was doing, kind of read a few pages to catch myself back up and even remember what I wrote, even if it was like the day before so it takes me like a full hour just to get into it. Like I'm not super, I'm not really someone who can just write in 15 minute increments. Like a lot of people like work on their lunch break and get a ton done and keep it moving. And um, like, I, I, I don't have the kind of, and I'm, I think few people have the kind of life where you can sort of like just have chunks of time every day. So I'm really trying to find like, where do I have at least three hours and mark like put those off and that that's my writing time and sometimes I get momentum from that and then like that night or you know there's a scene I'm excited that I'm in the middle of that I'm working on then I can go back and like do it in smaller time increments but I think what I've learned about myself is like I do need hours at a time to get anything done and that's hard because <laughs> I do have a baby and um like you know other things happening in my life too and so yeah, I'm really just figuring it out right now. But what I've started doing is going to the library in my town at least once a week, pro probably going to start doing two and just getting in like a full day. And then I'm like super productive and I try not to be on the internet or anything. I just like put my head down and work and set. I do have two friends that are like uh, writing right now pretty much full time. And so we've been trying to have two check-ins a day, like what are you going to work on? Um, but summer is just also just all over the place <laughs> in terms of I've been like traveling a little bit and you know have a lot upcoming too so it's really just about like every week looking at like okay when am I finding these chunks of time because that's like really the only time my brain works like I don't know I really want to be the type of person who writes in smaller chunks because it seems like great but it, I just can't get it to do that do you ever just go whole away for a weekend like go yeah, elsewhere nice. and really dive in yeah not so much as a parent. <laughs> um <laughs> I know that makes it hard yeah so not so much but I actually like I'm going to Portland tomorrow and um I have a couple upcoming trips and plane rides are awesome for that too because it's just like you can't I don't buy internet I just work on the writing and I just you know there's no choice but to work on that so so that's always a, a helpful time too yeah and you, you can only get up from your seat so many times like you're kind <laughs> of you're in the zone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. exactly so it's yeah it's I think it's I'm trying to be creative and I also like really try to utilize time when I'm not at my computer like whenever I'm falling asleep or even doing the dishes or walking or just, you know, getting something done around the house. I like make sure my thoughts return to the book and I start like trying to work through mental problems. So like, all, like my goal is for when I sit down on my computer to already know what I'm going to do because I have thought about it and I'm pretty good at that. Like I spend most, like most of my writing time is not when I'm at my computer. It's when I'm just like doing stuff in my life. And I just kind of train my brain to be like, okay, let's pick like a question I have about the book and try to work through that or start thinking about it. Um, because there's, yeah, like when I'm at, I don't have that much time to sit down. So when I do, I want to make sure I'm like ready to go. <laughs> so. And do you, do you write in linear fashion or do you bop around like, okay, this particular moment 
has come to mind while I'm out walking the dog and I'm going to do that? Or do you jot down notes for that later because it's further down on the outline? I have like a document that's just called random thoughts. And that's kind of just <laughs> random thoughts about future scenes like that I don't want to lose. Um, but I'm trying to write chronologically and like similarly, like I am also neurodivergent and I feel like with the first book, you know, people have often asked me like, why the dual timeline? Why the past and the present? And I was like, I had no reason. I mean, now I have reasons I can look back and see why it worked. But, you know, at the time it was just how the story came to me and like how I could write it. Like when, before I worked with my editor, actually all the flashback scenes were in like a totally, not random to me, but random to <laughs> the reader order. They weren't chronological. Um, and so we went back and restructured it. So it was less confusing, but my brain's like all over the place as it is. Um, and so I was actually trying to write this new one chronologically and having a really hard time with it. Um, but what I'm doing now, my editor like suggested uh, I write it in vignettes, meaning like very short chapters and suggested a book that does that. And I started reading it and I could totally see what she meant. Um, and I'm writing it that way now. And it's working so much better than when I was writing these longer chapters. Um, and I don't know ultimately if that'll be the final form, like really, really short chapters. But I think like my brain is just like, here's an image, here's an emotion, here's like some plot scene. And so maybe eventually I'll weave them together a little bit more. But right now I'm just like, let me just get everything down on the page. Um, and I am going chronologically, but it's not quite like, it doesn't feel quite as overwhelming to me when I'm like breaking it into smaller pieces, I guess. Yeah, that, that definitely seems um, just across the board for people that are um, neurodivergent, like having something broken up into smaller pieces for whatever reason just is more easily digestible than yeah the whole thing yeah. just for whatever reason like we malfunction yeah like I I have like self-diagnosed ADHD I don't know I haven't, <laughs> I've never actually gotten tested but um I like yeah if I can't see something it's like I, it doesn't exist to me and so to like imagine a whole book at the same time like I really like I've met with a lot of people like who are like here are like my coping mechanisms and here how I make it work and a lot of it is just like lists and visuals and having sticky notes that you can like see everything at the same time and like visual aids um because yeah again like I can't hold the whole book in my head at one time which is why it's so hard for me to like get back into it I have to like I think breaking it down is helpful because then I'm not also like, oh, let me go back and reread 50 pages to get to where I'm at now. I can just read the past maybe five and like, they're just, they're just shorter and they like, put me back in the moment quicker. So again, I don't know if this, if it works great, like I'll keep it this way, but for me, it's just working for drafting. Cause I can kind of like move on more quickly to the next thing. You mentioned, um, post-its, do you like storyboard it out on a wall? I want to, I haven't, I'm in my office, but I haven't figured out where to do that yet. I tried to do, I'm just, I don't know. I'm, I tried to do Excel. I just bought a bunch of post-its. So I might try to do that different color so I could do like themes, characters, plot points. Um, but so far I'm, I like, I'm also struggling too, to like, how do I spend my time? Like if I get three hours, do I spend that planning or do I just sit down and write, you know? So it's kind of like a mixed thing for me right now. Um, so I'm I'm kind of piecing it together. But yeah, when I do have the energy to write, I just sit down and do it. But otherwise, if I feel stuck, then I'm going to try to, I don't know where I put the post-it notes. See, this is the whole problem. But once I find them, I will use them and put them on the wall and hopefully storyboard. So yeah. I use, I use note cards too, like colored, like for filmmaking. I mean, it's a little bit different, but a lot of it the same of, of what order of things. And that way too, it's easier okay, like we don't want that scene there, just shuffle it. Okay, now it's there, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but I'll sit on the floor. Like I I try to sit at a desk when I'm doing things, but I always end up sitting on the floor or sprawled out somewhere. And so, yeah, if you can have like some, like I'll just have all of the cards just spread out. And then of course a cat, you know, comes and like- Right, <laughs> 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 from the cat. 
It's like, hey, sometimes the cats have a good idea. Like, oh yeah, right. maybe that, that scene should go there. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. No, I actually like my first book I wrote most of it laying down on my bed in my dorm room. Like I never went to the library. I was really weird like that. Or, you know, in my other room, like laying down. So I don't know, maybe that's a helpful thing for me. I do try to sit here at my desk, but the library helps too. So I don't know, I'm mixing it up. But yeah, it's I gotta try different things because some days have different energy and you gotta figure out what you're working with. <laughs> so. You have a hammock. I do have a hammock. It's kind of gross right now. I feel like it got destroyed during the winter. And also like every nice day is like air quality alert. I'm like, come on. <laughs> oh, no. So, yeah. Um, there's, I think I've used it once, but it's looking a little sad. I think I might need a new hammock. It is like a few, three years old, which isn't, you know, it's been outside for three Chicago winters. So maybe I need a, a new so one. Get a new hammock. You're supposed to bring them in in the winter. Yeah, see, we didn't, so, it, <laughs> <laughs> so um, but it's all right. Maybe we'll invest in a new one. So I know I had mentioned to you at uh, one of your readings that the cover art mm -hmm. looked like um, Van and Ty from Yellow Jackets. <laughs> a little bit. I've actually little been bit. thinking about that a lot there are like quite a few parallels to yellow jackets um you know the the, the end of the world and mm -hmm. just mental health and different dynamics um have have you have you drawn some of those lines of of between yeah so i so for people who don't know me i love yellow jackets <laughs> I like the first scene, I mean, the first season a little more, not because I like the second one too, but I think it was like the novelty of it. Like, oh my God, this show exists and we're allowed to have a show like this. The second season I also liked, but it spent a lot more time with the older uh, characters as well. So I kind of like the island scenes more. So I'm hoping we get some more of that in the, the next few seasons. But my brother was like, you know, yeah, he's like, I describe it to people as like, if you and I got in a room and made a show and you were like, how about soccer lesbians? And I was like, how about cannibalism? And that's the show. <laughs> so it's just like, so up my alley. Um, and it's one of my favorite things ever. But I, yeah, I, I think it probably did inform it. Actually, there was like one draft of this where, uh, I don't know if you remember, but there's this one scene in the book where she goes in this softball players dorm room at college and they end up hooking up but like when in one of the drafts she was watching yellow jackets when when, when she goes in and she was like you kind of look like van and avery's like oh okay and so, so then she starts calling her van as a nickname now it's just like red or something because she has red hair but we took out a lot of the pop culture references because it does kind of date the date the book and i I kind of wanted it. There's some still, but it's still like loosely, maybe now slash the future. <laughs> um, and so I didn't want to totally commit to like what year this is in. But at the same time, yeah, there there was a draft where I had that in it. I did take it out. Um, but I do <laughs> definitely see the parallels of kind of just being dropped into this new reality all of a sudden. Um, and not really knowing too, like what's a metaphor and what's not. Uh, I think what's so interesting about Yellow Jackets and I'm excited and nervous for the final seasons. I know there's a few more, but I'm like, they're doing so many interesting things where it's like, you don't know if it's supernatural or psychological, like is Ty's alter ego real or like mental illness or something magical, you know? And I sort of want some of the answers but not all of them you know so I'm, I'm really curious to see what they do uh with the with the final seasons and what they choose to answer versus leave kind of like we don't know <laughs> so yeah we'll that see. brings up um something that i i've seen on goodreads um with your ending is a mm -hmm. lot of people <laughs> saying that they wanted a more concrete mm -hmm. ending and it's something that with yellow jackets that I'm curious about, um, particularly with that final scene of the last season, mm -hmm. when you when you are working with dual timelines like that, they made a very definite decision that 
is going to have ramifications not only on the current timeline going forward, but then it changes the stakes for the past timeline as well. Yeah. So do do you have any thoughts on on that? Like, if if would you if you were going to do it again, would you have a more definite ending? I know I know you've said that you have one in mind. I do. <laughs> so yeah, this is so funny because I do sometimes read reviews, and this is a popular thing. Like a lot of people, and don't get me wrong, everyone is entitled to their opinion. And if it was not satisfying for a reader, I get it and I respect it and. You know, no, no, I'm not complaining about that. But for me, the story is really about Avery's depression and suicidal ideation. And so the kind of narrative arc of the book is once she like truly wants to live again, um, it's over. <laughs> like it almost doesn't matter what happens next to me. Um, and, you know, she wants the world to keep going. She wants it tomorrow. Um and, you know, like she's wishing for that. And so for, to me, that's the end and that's enough, whether or not they get it. Um, what I think, and also, yeah, there's some people who are like, I can't believe it ends with them dying. And I'm like, it doesn't, but okay. <laughs> um, but no, <laughs> uh, in my mind. So there was also another draft of this where um, the church scene came closer to the end and I think I had some hints in there that like there's a lot of frozen or um, like dehydrated food there. They store a lot of food there. There's a lot of, you know, like supplies for the campers. And in one version of this book, um, they there's like a line where they're sailing towards the camp on that lake to go get provisions to then presumably take back to try to like rebuild the bunker or survive uh, with the parents and so in my mind, that's kind of what happens. They're able to get enough food. I think personally that the asteroid does hit and there is a lot of devastation, but like Georgia and Peter talk about at the beginning of the book, like if you can survive the weather fallout and like the climate shifts, um, it's not going to look like the same world, but it is possible to survive it if you have enough supplies. So in my mind, that's what happens. They get the food, they bring it home. Um, you know, I think Peter and George just survive in their own way. And then eventually they kind of like rebuild the world together and they do move to New York, but it's like a shell of a city and they rebuild like this queer comedy type thing. Like this is my crazy vision for it. But um, yeah, in my mind, they, they survive. But I also kind of felt like that wasn't the point of the book. Um, I think if I were to, I don't, I'm happy with it. I, I wouldn't change it actually, even if given the chance, but I think if I were to add anything, it would just be like a very, very light, you know, hint of like somehow like morning came again or something like that. Like in, in sinu the, actually like the last line of my acknowledgements, which I know is not part of the book, but um, says like, I'll see you in the morning or something like that. And that was also my nod to like the next day does come and they do make it through it again. That's not part of the story. So I understand people's frustration, but yeah, to me, it's like, as long as she wants to live, that was the point of, of this journey. And that's kind of like the mirror image to the first opening pages. Um, so I don't think the world ends, but if that's people's interpretation, that's valid. Uh, if they wanted more, that's valid. Uh, and if they think they made it, that's what I think. But uh, you know, there's no really like right answer either. Yeah, I mean, I, for me personally, I found it hopeful because for me personally, I would rather want to live and mm -hmm. die than be living and want to die. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's like the flip, right? <laughs> that's Yeah, and I think too, like uh, one thing I really, especially when, okay, in the more adult versions of it, like it was a little more clear that the world did end and I... I thought still like we get so we are not promised anything in this life. Some people get two days, not even some people get a hundred years. Most of us get somewhere in between and it's just kind of luck. And of course, you know, like a lot of different environmental um, factors and things like that, but most of us don't know what time we're going to get. And it could be nine days. It could be longer, but it could still be really beautiful if you're like intentional about how you're spending your time and how you treat people and the relationships that you're in and what you're trying to give yourself in terms of like getting to know yourself. Um, 
So like my original idea with this was like nine days could still be really beautiful and worth living. Um, and I, so I actually, I also read, and I never recommended this book for a hundred different reasons, <laughs> but I read A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara while I was writing this. Um, and I was really moved by a lot of it, but what's funny is my interpretation of that book was so different than her intentions for it <laughs> because um, my reading was, here's this character, for those of you who haven't read it, it's like this really brutal 700 page adult book um, about this character who's just suffered tremendous abuse and is struggling with it over the course of his life. Um, and it's beautifully written, but it, again, it's very brutal and not super happy. <laughs> but I was really moved by my interpretation of the book and it also jumps around in time was like this person has a devastating life it is so painful there's so much hurt in it and yet look at all the beauty in it look at these people in his life who really care for him like look at this moment where his partner like notices his shoes untied and bends down to tie it for him without even thinking about it like there's all these little beautiful moments um and to me, that book was like, no matter how devastating life is, there's all this gorgeous love that can make make it worth it still. Like he had, you know, this terrible existence. And yet to me, it was like, I'm still so glad this character was here and people loved him. Um, she did not intend it that way. <laughs> She's definitely said in interviews that she wanted it to be like, there are some things in life that are not survivable. And no matter how much love you have in your life, sometimes it's not enough. And so, again, I think that was more her intention with the story, but I read it very differently um, and really loved that interpretation that I had of it. And that sort of factored into my writing as well of like, she has this life that she's struggling with um, for, you know, a couple different reasons. And what would it look like to find beauty in that, even if it's still like, you know, her depression doesn't go away over the course of the nine days. She just figures out how to like shift her perspective a little and to open up enough to let people help her. Well, and I think that's one of the big takeaways too, is that a lot of literature and particularly television, um, it's, you have this issue, you know, someone's, um, either struggling with mental health or addiction or whatever it is. And then it's one bottle episode about that thing. They, mm -hmm. you know, get help and then they never address it again. And mm -hmm. that's not real. These are things that are integrated into your life and there can still be pain, but there can be beauty around it. Mm -hmm. I like what you said about the, you know, nine days that can be really beautiful. I mean, Romeo and Juliet is used as a love story, but really it's, it, most of it is, is <laughs> tragic. And that takes, you know, that's over like what, that's like nine days. I don't know the exact time, yeah. but that's yeah. one of the, the most sourced stories. Right. Uh, you know, they, they use that in so many things and that doesn't, you know they're dead that doesn't <laughs> but people point right. to that as a beautiful love story so it's interesting that leaving something ambiguous came off to people as you know incomplete or I don't know like you think yeah. about, like I love the um the 80s movie Can't Buy Me Love and at the end they're on the riding lawnmower riding off into the sunset you don't know they could they could crash that thing and die at the end of the street or, you know, they could break up in a week, but it's, yeah, you don't need to know the ending and, 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 and the ending is, you know, yet to be. Totally. I would love to, I would love to have people write their own version of what happens after these pages and see what people were hoping for or think happened. Um, because I, I'm interested. Like, I, I don't know. I, I also, I mean, some people have, I think, kind of said like, oh, the author didn't know how to end it. And I did, but <laughs> I also don't know that it would have been satisfying necessarily to be like, I want to live and I get to, or I want to live and I don't get to. <laughs> like, that's a bummer. Um, so I, 
I don't know that um maybe I didn't know how to end it I don't know because in my mind those two endings are each unsatisfying to me in their own way like getting to know for sure that all is well I don't know to me that's not really the point so I don't know I would love to see other people write what they were hoping for on the on the next pages because it would be a fun experience but um for me this was enough I think wanting more is the mark of good writing like Mm -hmm. we want to follow those characters and I like what you said about people writing their own um (laughs) I haven't checked, but I wonder if this is on AO3. And if it's not, I've not checked either. <laughs> if if it if it should be so that people can go for it. You have no go. permission to <laughs> write whatever. Uh, I don't think I'll ever write a sequel. I could imagine actually though, maybe writing a short story for like an anniversary or something of like what I think happens or like their new life in New York, you know, a few years later, jump to. Um, I don't think I'll ever write a full book of that, but yeah, I, I would be curious like to see what people think they wanted to happen. I am Jen St. Jude. I am the author of If Tomorrow Doesn't Come, and I live here in Chicago-ish. <laughs> Uh, I use they, them, or she, her pronouns, um, and I'm pretty okay with a lot of different identifiers. I mean, I do identify mostly as like a non-binary lesbian, but that's, you know, that's today. It changes all the time. (laughs) So...